Hello, and welcome to Vovork. I'm Brian Watrous. This is the eighth in a 10-part video series in which we're exploring how to build a vCenter orchestrator environment on top of VMware Fusion. In the previous video, we saw how to install and configure the vCenter server virtual appliance. In this video, we'll see how to install and configure the vCenter orchestrator virtual appliance. To install VCO, we'll begin by deploying the VCO virtual appliance. Then we'll verify that the VCO services are running. Next, we'll configure the VCO server to boot with the host that it's running on, ESXi02. And then last of all, we'll add the vCenter server to the VCO server. Okay, let's install VCO. To begin with, we will double-click the vSphere client. And in here, we're going to log into the VCO, excuse me, the vCenter virtual appliance. We'll log in as the account root, and we'll use the password capital V, capital M, W A R E, one bang. Then we'll click the login button. I'm using the 60 day evaluation mode, so we have a message here. I'll click OK to dismiss it. And then, as you can see, I'm in Host and Clusters view, and I've expanded the vCenter inventory, and highlighted here is ESXi02, which is the host on which we're going to deploy the VCO virtual appliance. To do so, we'll go to the File menu and select Deploy OVF Template. And on the screen here, you can see I've already browsed to the VCO virtual appliance OVA file, but to make certain you know the path, I'm going to click on Browse. I'll go to Z colon. Again, recall that Z colon is the file share from my Windows VM to Mac OS X. Over in Mac OS X in my Documents folder, I have a folder called Virtual Machines. And in there, there's a folder called ISOs and OVFs a folder in there called vSphere 5.5 Update 1A. And in here, we have a folder called Orchestrator, which is where we previously downloaded this OVA file. So we'll select the OVA file and click Open. Then we'll click the Next button. Here we have a brief summary of the virtual appliance. We're going to go ahead and click the Next button. Then on this screen, we'll accept the end user license agreement by clicking the accept button. After doing so, we'll click the next button. And rather than use this long name, I'm going to change the name of my VCO server to VCO. We'll click next. Very important step here. We need to make certain that we select thin provision in order to reduce the amount of disk space that we consume. Then we'll click next. And now in this screen here, we can specify a number of different configuration parameters, which is kind of nice. We don't have to wait till the installation is done to do these steps. So the root password is, is the account that can be used when logging into the VCO virtual appliance, for instance, using a SSH client such as PuTTY. So I'm going to set that to capital V, capital M, W-A-R-E, one, bang. That's the same password I'm going to use here and elsewhere on this screen. So I've set the root password. The next password is for an account called VMware. That's the default account that's used when logging into something we'll see later on in this video called the VCO configurator. So again, I'm going to set it to the same password as I just mentioned a moment ago. And at that point, we have the account name set for our two our password set for our two accounts. Scroll down a little bit here. I'm going to set the host name of this VCO virtual appliance to vco.vvork.info. Then the gateway address in my environment is 172.16.245.2. The DNS server is 172.16.245.1. The IP address of my VCO server in as it's listed in DNS is 172.16.245.104. 
and the net mask is 255.255.255.0. .255 so we've set all those parameters. We'll click Next. On the summary screen, we'll click Power On after deployment, then click Finish. As you can see, the VCO Virtual Appliance has successfully been deployed. I'll click the Close button. And here we can actually see the newly created virtual machine called VCO. Uh, I'd like to take a peek in it. The, the, the machine is listed as powered on, and in fact it is powered on, but um, it, I seriously doubt it's fully booted up just yet. So let's take a look in the console by clicking this window here and see how it's doing booting up. Okay, the VCO server virtual appliance is fully booted up now, and as we can see on the screen here, the IP address is set correctly to .104. Now what we'd like to do here, though, briefly, is just do a little sanity check. We're going to log in by hitting Enter. The account that we use to log into this console is root. Password is capital V, capital M, W A R E, one bang. And we're logged in. Now there's two services uh, that you need running for VCO. One is a service that is the VCO server itself. So we're going to check to see if that's running by running service VCO server status. And as you can see, the VCO server itself is running. Now I'm going to check one other service here, which is actually the one that's important for what we're just about to do. A service called VCO Configurator. So this is the VCO Configurator service, and as you can see, it too is running. If either these services weren't running, we could instead run um, service followed by the service name followed by start. And obviously, if you change start to stop, that can stop the service. Okay, so we have our services running. That all looks good. We'll type exit to get out of the console window. And at this point, we will close the console window itself. So to get keyboard, or to get my mouse back, I'll type control alt. And I'll close the console window. And just to show you everything's working fine, if I click on the summary tab here, notice that we can see VMware Tools is running, and there's our IP address. So everything looks good here. Now what we're going to do next is we want the VCO server to boot whenever ESXi2 boots. So we'll select ESXi02. We'll go to the Configuration tab. This is very much like what we did with the VCVA machine over on host ESXi01. We'll scroll down past the hardware section, down into the software section, where we will click on the link labeled Virtual Machine Startup Shutdown. And let's scroll up here. Uh, as you can see, the VCO server is currently configured to st be started manually. What we want is for it to boot automatically. So we'll click on the Properties link. And then by checking this first checkbox, we'll tell the host that it's going to be following some rules that describe which virtual machines to start and stop when it, the host, starts. We'll leave the default two-minute uh, delay in between virtual machines, but in case uh, any virtual machine, we only have one virtual machine on this host right now, but in case there are more in the future and we want them to boot up more quickly, we'll go ahead and click the VMware Tools checkbox to make certain that the VMs boot as quickly as possible. Then the key thing we need to do here is select the VCO Virtual Appliance Click Move Up once, click Move Up again, and now, after we click the OK button, the VCO server will boot up whenever the second host, ESXi02, whenever that host boots. So we'll click OK. And at this point, that's all the configuration that we need to do through the vSphere client. So we'll close the vSphere client. And next, what we're going to do is to use that VCO configurator tool 
that we uh, just checked on. We'll do so by clicking, in this case, Google Chrome or any web browser will do. And in here, we are going to go to http colon slash slash vco.vivorg.info. Once again, self-signed certificate, so we'll click on proceed anyway. And now we're on a screen where you can do all sorts of things, but at this stage of the game, what we need to do is to launch the orchestrator configuration utility, also known as the VCO configurator. So we'll click on orchestrator configuration. Uh, notice, uh, by the way, the URL is just about to change here. If you ever want to go directly into the VCO configurator and bypass that previous screen, just go to the URL that you see on the top of the screen here. Now, the username that we're going to log in here is not root. The one and only account that you can use to log into the configurator is the account called VMware. And as you know from the earlier part of this demonstration, when we installed the VCO virtual appliance, we set the password here to capital V, capital M, W, A, R, E, one, bang. Um, if you are using a VCO server, uh, not the VCO virtual appliance, but the VCO server that runs on top of Windows, um, or older versions, the default password for this VMware account is VMware. So if in the installation of the VCO server you're ever not asked to supply the name, excuse me, the password for this VMware account, the default username and default password are both VMware. We'll click login to log in. And now that we're logged in, we can see that there are a number of different uh, sections we can go in the VCO configurator to configure VCO itself. And ultimately our goal is to turn all these little indicator lights to green, which they already are. Uh, however, there is a little bit more configuration that we want to do. While we could start up the VCO server at this point, in fact, it already is running, we already saw, we're going to configure VCO right now so that it knows about our vCenter server. Now to do so, we'll go to the network section. In order to be able to communicate with the, the vCenter server, we need to import the vCenter server's certificate. So we'll click on the tab labeled SSL Trust Manager. And here we're asked which URL to import the certificate from. We're gonna type Let's see, what do we type here? We're going to type vcva.vvork.info. That's the host name of our vCenter server virtual appliance. Now, alternatively, you can import the certificate via a file, but in our case, it's just going to be easier to import from uh, across the network using this URL. So we'll click the import button. It shows us information about the certificate. It all looks good here, so we'll click on import. And as we can see, the SSL certificate has been successfully imported. Now the next thing that we're going to do is go over to licenses. And we're going to have this VCO server use our vCenter server license. So we select use vCenter server license. The alternative is to manually uh, type in your license. Notice, by the way, that VCO is licensed using the vCenter server license, not a separate VCO license. So here we're going to tell VCO how to connect to the vCVA, the vCenter virtual appliance, in order to hook up and get its license. So the first thing we're going to type is vcva.vvork.info. Uh, you'll notice that I'm typing that into a field labeled host. Uh, throughout the VCO and the, its configurator, when you see the word host, it doesn't mean host in the sense of a virtual machine platform. It doesn't mean your ESXi server. When VCO talks about a host, it means that in the more uh, network generic sense of the word. It's just a machine on the network. So the port number we're going to use to connect to the vCenter server is port 443. We're going to use secure communications. Um, this path, just leave it as is. If you want to know what that path is about, come join me in the VCO class and we'll teach you all about that. But for the username and password, we're going to type root and capital V, capital M, W, A, R, E, one, bang. 
Now make certain you click on the Apply Changes button. And as you can see, we've successfully hooked up and are using the vCenter server's license. Now at this point, what we're going to do is scroll down in the VCO configurator and go to the, the section where we can configure the vCenter server plugin for VCO. So we'll click on vCenter server, and we're going to specify that we want to add a new vCenter server host. Again, remember here, host means host in the general network sense of the word. So we're going to have an enabled connection, and the host name of our vCenter server is vcva.vvork.info. Obviously, that's the name of my machine. You'll change yours to the appropriate value. We're going to leave the port in this checkbox and the path alone. And then we can either choose to have, uh, whenever a VCO workflow does something in vCenter, we can either have the user's VCO credentials passed into vCenter. That way, every workflow runs under the identity of the, the VCO user. Or if we want to keep things simple, we can select the share a unique session radio button, which allows us to have all VCO workflows that are doing things in vCenter to run those vCenter tasks as the same user. In our case, we're going to do that with the account called root and the password capital V, capital M, W-A-R-E, one, bang. Um, instead of using the root account, you may have some sort of service account that can be used to log into your vCenter server. We'll click Apply Changes. Now that that vCenter server has been added, we'll go to Startup Options. If ever you need to restart the VCO Configurator server, uh, you can do so using the technique I showed you before, logging in directly to the console of the VCO server, or you can click on this link. But right now we don't need to restart the VCO configuration service for anything that we've done. What we need to do is restart the VCO server itself. Not the configurator, but the VCO server, which we can do here. You'll notice there are a couple other links just above there that allow you to start and stop the server. So we're going to restart the VCO service. And now the VCO server has been restarted. At this point, we'll go ahead and log out of the configurator service. And we'll go ahead and close this browser window because we don't need the configurator anymore. And that concludes this particular demonstration. Be sure to come back for the next video because in the next video we're going to learn how to install and run the orchestrator client, which is the main tool that you're going to be using when you use VCO to develop workflows. So see you in the next video.